live stream brought to you by Portland State University's Learning Center. This is a two physics 212 live stream and today we're going to be talking about magnetic fields and magnetic forces. <coughs> so as always I'm going to post a few links in the chat window. These are links to the Learning Center's website, the Learning Center's Facebook, and the Learning Center's Instagram. So definitely follow them on Facebook and Instagram to get live updates for any new services that they have. They also have a link to the attendance sheet. <coughs> so fill out that form and uh, we'll let your teacher know that you stopped by. And let's get started talking about magnetic forces. <coughs> so we can define the idea of this magnetic force with, um, well, I should start by saying any charged particle that's flying through a magnetic field will have a magnetic force acted upon it. And we can find out the magnitude <coughs> and direction of that force using the equation Fb is equal to the charge of that particle times the, the cross product of the velocity and the magnetic field, which is going to be equal to, just to find its magnitude, Q magnitude of V magnitude of B sine of theta. And in this case, theta is going to be the angle between the velocity vector and the magnetic field vector. So in the depiction I have down here with this hand on it, it's this orange angle that I'm throwing in there. That's your, gonna be your theta. <clears throat> and that just gives you the magnitude of it. To find that direction, notice that the force direction is always gonna be kind of orthogonal to <clears throat> the direction of the vector or the velocity vector and the magnetic field vector. So that's what we get when we get a cross product. We always get that orthogonal vector perpendicular to both of the other two vectors. <clears throat> we can determine that using what we call the right hand rule. Uh, the right hand rule <coughs> for uh, a charged particle with a velocity, I usually have my fingers point towards the direction of the velocity and then I would curl my fingers in the direction of the magnetic field. And, and when I do that, my thumb would point upwards, in this case, to the direction of the force on a positive charge. If it's a negative charge, the force is going in the other direction. So we do the right-hand rule the same way with the negative charge. We just flip our thumb at the end. And we can do that kind of backwards. So if we know the direction of the force, we can then um, turn our hand so we can have the direction of the velocity and then we can determine the direction of the magnetic field. Just realize it was a little off camera there. Uh, another way to do it is to kind of use your fingers as like an axis. So your <coughs> middle finger would kind of point out towards the magnetic field, your pointer fingers pointing out towards the velocity and your thumb would point up towards the vector of the force. Again that's for a positive charge. Negative charge you have to flip your hand over and point down after you do that. <coughs> and we have a notation since we're working in the three dimensions where we talk about this idea of out of the page being, if it's coming up out of the page, it'd be like a circle with a dot and into the page would be kind of this crosshair type of deal. <coughs> and I like to think about it as an arrow. So if you picture the vector going as like an arrow from like a bow and arrow, archery arrow, the tip of the arrow would be coming at you, so you'd just see that dot coming at you. And then if it's flying away from you, it, you see the tail feathers kind of going away. So in this case, this would be into the, or into the page. And this one is out of the page. And I have kind of a uniform magnetic field going that way. In this case, it's going into the page there. And we can do a quick example. So if I were to have um, a positron, which is, it's got the charge of an electron, but it's positively charged. And we're gonna say it's flying this way here to my right. <coughs> so again, my camera's reversed. So I could fly, point my fingers going towards it, right? And then I would curl in this case, I'd curl into the page. I'm facing you, so you'd go this way and curl and you'd see the force vector would go upwards like this. 
So it's good to do it yourself. <coughs> Take your hand and point it to the right. Look at this because I'm pointing it to the left because my camera's inversed. And you'd rotate like you're pointing into the page and your force would go upwards in that case. And since it's a positive charge, the force on that particle would end up going up. Anytime you have a particle flying through a magnetic field, it doesn't just kind of go up like we had with two charged plates with capacitance. We, it'll actually curl because it creates kind of this centripetal force kind of pulling on it. So it starts spinning into a circle. <coughs> Assuming that the magnetic field is orthogonal to the direction of the velocity. <coughs> so we can also say here, force magnetic is equal to, obviously we know the ex mass times the centripetal acceleration, which is equal to mv squared over r, r being the radius at which it ends up spinning and making a circle. So if we set these forces equal to each other, the equation we have up here Assuming that the magnetic field and the velocity vector are 90 degrees, so I can say if theta is equal to 90 degrees, sine of theta is equal to 1, right? That simplifies our equation, so it's just v QVB. Doing that, I can set QVB equal to MV squared over R. And... <coughs> then I can solve for the radius that it's going to make because any charged particle, like I said, is going to make some type of radius. And we can use this to determine lots of fun things. So here, solving for the radius, I can see that R is going to equal the mass velocity squared over QVB. The velocities will cancel out for one on the top row, the bottom one will as well. So that's MV over QB. And if we relate this to kinetic energy, we could see that that's going to be the square root 2mke over qb. That's just using the idea that kinetic energy is one half mass velocity squared. We're not going to really use that in these cases, so I'm just kind of noting that that's a thing. This equation here is going to be kind of the right equation to use whenever you're trying to find the radius of the spin of any type of... Um, charged particle flying through a magnetic field. We could determine other things about it, being like the period and the frequency, just going off of your rotational kinetics you learned last term. Um, so in this case, the period of that rotation would end up being 2 pi r over v, 2 pi r being the distance around that circle, v being the velocity, the tangential velocity for it, which is equal to 2 pi m over qb. And that's equal to the period. Period T is the capital T is just the notation we usually use for period. Uh, we can also turn that into angular frequency. Remember, ang uh, frequency is the inverse of a period, so one over T. So, but to do angular frequency, that would equal two pi F, which is going to be equal to Q B over M. So all I did is substitute in my T there, put it a 1 over T, and the two pi's end up canceling each other out. So we end up with QB just over the M. Now we can use these to solve uh, some problems now. It's just some basic relationships we had between the force of the magnetic force on a charged particle with velocity and um, centripetal force like we had before. So first, let's look at a few different um, examples of using the right-hand rule to find the direction of the forces. <coughs> so starting with this first one, A, we see the magnetic field is coming out of the page towards us, and the velocity vector is going downwards. So if I were to point my hand, well, I'd have to point it this way. My velocity vector would go down. Make sure you're using the right hand, and you curl your fingers out of the page, so it's coming out of the page. My thumb is pointing to the left, right? So my velocity vector is going to be going that direction. So that's the, I'm sorry, my force vector is going to be going that direction. As that particle pulls on that, the force is going to pull. And as that force starts to move on it, the velocity, uh, the velocity vector of the particle is going to change direction. And that's how you're going to get that nice spin. It's going to be spinning into a circle there. On part B, again, we have the 
velocity in this case is going upwards, but we're curling this way to the right hand side. So my force vector is going to go into the page. So we can say that's going to go into the page that direction. For part C, we're going to have that velocity vector going to the right again. And this time um, it's going to be going into the page. So our force vector is going to be going up. You can't see my hand. Velocity vector this way. I curl my fingers because the magnetic field is going into the page and my thumb is pointing up. So that's going to show me that my force vector is going to go up. It's the force, the magnetic force of B. <coughs> this next one, part D, again, we have that, <coughs> I'm sorry, the velocity vector is going opposite direction now. This is the one that's really confusing because my camera is. I'm going to do it the way I see it on the page. I encourage you to do it the same when you see it. <coughs> so the velocity vector is going that way. But when we rotate our hands, you know, realize that the angle between the, I'm going to redraw that B vector again. This angle is 180 degrees. So remember our equation said V, B, let's see, Q, V, B, sine of theta. In this case, theta is 180 sine of 180 is zero. So this is actually gonna have zero vector. So there's, there's not gonna have any force on this particle because the magnetic field is 180 degrees. The same would be true if it was zero degrees in the same direction, parallel or anti-parallel, it's always gonna have zero force on it. We can move along to part E. In this case, <coughs> the velocity is going into the page, but we're going to curl up, right? So our force is going to be pointing out to the right. I should note that all of these charged particles are going are positively charged. I believe it said, yeah, I should have noted that at the beginning. They're positive charges. If they were negative charges, the direction of force would be in the opposite for all of these. Part F, we have the velocity coming out of the page. So it's coming towards me. I gotta tilt my hand this way because I wanna rotate my hand that way. Whoa. It's hard when it's all coming behind you. And my thumb is gonna be pointing down as I do that. So the force vector on this one is going down. And that's how you use the right hand rule if you have the magnetic field and the velocity. We can also use it in this, these instances here, there's just a couple examples where we have the force in the magnetic field, but we don't know the velocity. So I like to start by pointing my thumb in the direction of the force. Notice it's a negative charge, right? <coughs> so I'd start out by pointing my thumb in the direction of the force, and then I flip it to the other side. <coughs> and then I try to rotate my hand so my fingers are pointing towards the direction of the magnetic field. In this case, they wanna be pointing behind me that way. <coughs> and then I can straighten my hand out and see my velocity is going to my right. This is my V vector. Looking at part B, <coughs> same idea. I start with my thumb pointing up. Again, this is a negative charge. We've got to flip the thumb down. And then my fingers, in my case, are pointing to my right, their left. Right? So I straighten those out, and it's going to be going down into the page. Uh, finally here we have, again, the force vector is going this direction, well, to my left on there. Flip it around so it's pointing to my right because it's a negative charge. And we've got to make sure the fingers can go out of the page. So I actually have to flip my hand this way, and we can see the velocity vector is going to be pointing down when I straighten my fingers out. So the velocity in this one is downwards. So we can use that right-hand rule to find the velocity as well as the force like we did in the previous examples. Um, just a couple more here. We're trying to find the direction of the magnetic field. It's the same basic idea. I like to just use my hand like a flat palm. In this case, we're looking at a positive charge again. Since we have a positive charge, we don't have to flip the forces or anything like that. I can just lay my palm flat on the page like I, the part A has it. I can curl my fingers in the direction that I want to go. So I know the magnetic field here is going into the page. 
So that's B. Um, similarly with part B, my thumb needs to point into the page and my fingers point down and my fingers will curl to my left, probably your right based on the camera. <coughs> so my left says that that vector should be going that way. <coughs> Last one, and we can get on to some uh, more computational problems. Um, again, pointing my hand this way. So my hand, from my perspective, looks like the force is coming that way. My velocity vector is going along here, and I can curl my hand back. That's pointing out of the page towards me. So I can draw out of the page B vector. And that's how we can do it. So there's it's just a quick breakdown on how to define your forces, velocities, and magnetic fields. If you have two of the three, you can always find the direction of the fourth one, or the third one. <coughs> as far as magnitude goes, you have to use mathematics. <coughs> Here's a problem here. We have a cosmic ray proton moving towards the Earth. It's moving at 5.3 times 10 to the seventh meters per second, which is really fast. We're going to ignore the idea of special relativity now in relativistic velocities. And <coughs> it experiences a magnetic force of 1.64 times 10 to the negative 16 newtons. So that's a pretty small force, 10 to the negative 16, but it's still getting that force. What is the strength of the magnetic field if it were 44 degree angle between it and the proton's velocity? So I know based on this, we have make it a little bit bigger a velocity vector kind of coming down this is the velocity of my proton I know that there's some magnetic field that's pulling down or in some direction on it I, that's B and I know that the angle between those is 44 degrees this is 44 degrees So just using the equation for the magnetic force, which is equal to Q, VB, let's say I get V cross with B, which is going to be equal to Q magnitude of V, magnitude of B, sine of theta. Plugging in the values that we have, because we know the force, I guess we can rearrange. We want to find the strength of the magnetic field. So we've got to solve this equation for B ultimately. So I can say that the force magnetic divided by Q V magnitude sine of theta will equal B. Plugging that into, or plugging our values in for that, we know we have 1.64 times 10 to the negative 16 newtons. We're going to divide that by, was it 1.16, I think? 1. Oh, 1.6. I always throw extra ones in there. Times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs which is the charge of a proton. It's going to be a positive because it's a proton. Um, I'm going to multiply that by the velocity, 5.3 times 10 to the seventh meters per second. And then multiply that on the bottom again by sine of 44 degrees. And if we plug all that into our calculator, we should be able to solve for the magnitude of the force a magnitude of the magnetic field. Let's take a look. So we have 1.64 times 10 to the negative 16 newtons. There it is. We're going to divide all of that by 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Works. times 5.3 times 10 to the seventh meters per second and finally multiply that by sine of 44 degrees 
get a few more significant figures there. 2.784 times 10 to the negative 5 Tesla. Tesla is, of course, the units for magnetic field. So that was 2.784 times 10 to the negative 5 Tesla. It should be noted that Earth's magnetic field is actually to the order of 10 to the negative 5. So that corresponds with what I believe is the true magnitude of the uh, Earth's magnetic field. So moving on, in this problem, it's kind of a long read, but we have a mass spectrometer, <coughs> which is being used to separate common oxygen-16 from a much rarer oxygen-18. So in this case, we have an ion source, which is sh uh, accelerating these um, charged protons, or charged um, atoms, through, in this case, we have a voltage potential and a magnetic field. So the voltage potential, which is going this way, has this electric force pulling up on it. But the magnetic field has that force pulling down on it. So those two cancel each other out, so the velocity of the charged particle stays straight in that regard. And then once it hits this magnetic field over here, it's no longer in that potential between those two plates, so it loses the electric force and it gets that kind of curl down to the bottom. And here we want to know the ratio of the masses, or it tells you the ratio of the masses, which are 16 to 18. That's oxygen 16 versus oxygen 18. So it's just telling you how many, um, like the total sum of neutrons and protons in the nucleus. It tells you the mass of oxygen 16 is 2.66 times 10 to the negative, um, that should be negative 12. Or no, I'm sorry, negative 26. Extra one in there. Ignore that one. So to the negative 26 kilograms. And they are slightly charged and travel at this velocity and we have a magnetic field of 1.1 tesla so they want to know the separation which is 2 times r2 minus 2 times r1 so it's really you can see on the depiction here 2 times r2 is the diameter that mass 2 is going to go out and 2 times r1 is the diameter that mass 1 is going to spin out and the lighter one would be affected less by that force, right? The heavier one would, no, yeah. The lighter one would be affected more by that force. The heavier one would be affected less by that force. So the heavier one should have a higher spin or higher radius to it. So I'm gonna write here that, um, say the change in distance D, which is here, this is our delta D that little distance at the bottom, if you can see that, is equal to 2, I'm going to say the radius of 18 minus two, twice the radius of 16. And that's going to be oxygen 18 minus oxygen 16. And we can factor out that 2 for simplicity's sake, R18 minus R16. Now we know previously we defined the radius in these cases to be equal to the mv over qb. <coughs> so we can substitute that value into our delta d equation up top and say that delta d is equal to 2 times, in this case would be the mass of 18 times the velocity divided by q B. So the velocity Q and B are going to be constants for both of the particles. Just the mass is really the only difference. Let's subtract from that the mass of 16 V over QB. And the other thing they told us up top here is the ratio of the two isotopes, 16 to 18. So we know that the ratio of mass 16 divided by mass 18 is equal to 16 over 18. They have that proportionality to them. So we can write, in this case, mass 18 in terms 
of mass 16. It's 18 over 16. <coughs> Just doing a basic kind of cross multiplication type of thing there. What we want to do then is rewrite mass 18 up there in terms of mass 16 so we don't have to try to solve for two different equations. So rewriting that, I can say that delta D is equal to 2 times, I'll say the mass of uh, 18, which is really, oops, I put, so that shouldn't be equal to, I'm sorry, that should be multiplied by, because it's mass 16 times that ratio, because my mass 18 is a little bit bigger than it. So mass 16 times 18 divided by, put that 16 here, QD minus mass 16 divided by, oh, I forgot the velocity, velocity cube v. <coughs> so I just kind of stuck this ratio in here, <coughs> multiplying it by the mass there. We can factor out all the common factors of that now. So d2 is equal to 2 mass 16, put a bigger m, even smaller 16, big v divided by qb. So those are common for both of those, and this would be equal to 18 over 16 minus 1. So now I've got a nice term for delta D. We can now plug in the values that we know for the rest of everything. We know that the mass of 16 is going to be equal to 2.66 times 10 the negative 26 kilograms. And we know that the Q, the charge, is going to equal 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. We know the magnetic field is equal to 1.1 Tesla. And we know the velocity is equal to 5.4 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. So now we just have to plug everything into our equation here to find out what that change in distance is between those. So that's going to be 2 times 2.66 times 10 to the negative 26 kilograms times the velocity, which is 5.4 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. I'm going to divide all of that by the charge, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Um, also in the bottom is B, 1.1 Tesla. And we're going to multiply that by this ratio, 18. And I can get common denominators there, just changing 1 to be 16 over 16. So that's going to be 18 minus 16, which is really 2. 2 over 16, which is really equal to 1 eighth. Simplify 1 over 8. <coughs> so we can plug that into our calculator to get our answer. So that's 2 times 2.66 times 10 the negative 26, I'm going to say it's in kilograms, times 5.4, times 10 to the 6, which is meters per second. I'm going to divide that by 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 in Coulomb and multiply by 1.1 Tesla. We're going to then multiply this entire thing by 1 eighth. And we got about 0 0.204 meters. So about a fifth of a meter, 0 0.204 meters. That's going to be the distance between those two isotopes when they hit the target areas there and there. So this is a pretty good way using this mass spectrometer to 
um, separate different isotopes, different charged particles of different masses. Because based on the mass, even a slight difference in the mass, you get a pretty good uh, separation there. It does take a magnetic field of 1.1 Tesla, which is quite a big mag magnetic field. We saw in our previous problem, the magnitude of the magnetic field on Earth just naturally is 10 to the negative fifth five Teslas. So it's a really small magnetic field on Earth. So we have to generate a lot of power to create a magnetic field that powerful. But if you can do that, it's pretty good at separating these things out. You can probably use one that's slightly weaker. You get a little bit less separation, but enough for you to still detect them. So let's talk about a different type of problem. These are going to be magnetic fields generated by a long wire, by current, by current going through a long wire. So I can draw a quick depiction here. We say we had some wire here. Make it look pretty. So that's kind of a cross segment of my wire. Just some segment. If I had a current flowing through that wire, so my current is going that way. There's an arrow there. This is my current. <coughs> I can determine the direction of the magnetic field as this picture is showing, and that's what I'm going to try to show, just by gripping the wire. If I grip the wire, my thumb needs to point in the direction of the magnetic field. Again, my camera's flipped, but in the direction of the magnetic field. And we'll see that um, my fingers will curl around it in the direction of the magnetic field. So again, my thumb is going in the direction of current. I might have said it backwards. So with my thumb in the direction of current, like it's shown here, with the thumb is up, in the direction of the current, your fingers will point in the direction of that magnetic field. So in this one we have up top here, we can see our magnetic field is kind of kind of come around like that, going under the pipe there, coming out of the pipe here, or out from behind it, and then going down in front of it, just rotating around behind it like that. And w the equation we want to use here the magnetic field is going to be equal to mu naught, which is just a constant permittivity of, mag of magnetism in the universe, times I, the current, divided by 2 pi R, where R is going to be the distance away from that wire that you are. So the farther away from that wire you get, the weaker that magnetic field is going to be. Um, and it's all based on the intensity of the current. So if you double the current, you're going to double the strength of the magnetic field at any one distance. If you double the length of it, you're going to half the magnetic field, or not the length of it, double, or double the distance away from it, you're going to half the magnetic field. So we can talk about the force that we have say uh, from one wire to another wire if we have two wires traveling with some current flowing through them the force which from wire one to wire two or the force that wire one has on wire two is going to equal the current of two times the length of two which is a vector cross with product with the magnetic field of one because it's the magnetic field of uh, the first wire, we'll say, that's actually having the force effect on the second wire. So we use the current and the length of the second wire, but the magnetic field from the first wire. Um, simplifying that to find just our magnitude, it's I2, L2, times B1, sine of theta. And again, theta is going to be the angle between the magnetic field of B1 and the length of a L2. And that's going to go in the direction of the current flow as well. Because current doesn't really flow in a vector, but it does, um, the length has a direction to it. So 
this is going to be the largest when um, the magnetic field and the wires are parallel or the wires are parallel to each other or the magnetic field and the wires perpendicular to each other which makes sine of 90 equal 1 so that's when everything's going to be the largest so I can say f1 2 max would be equal to I2 L2 B1 or we can even say you know the f determine it based on force per length because the length of the wires might be very long so we can just move that L over and say like the force per meter so I'm just gonna simply write force per length of 2 so 1 1 2 is equal to I2 B1 which if we substitute it in now the equation for the magnetic field we would get I2 times mu naught I1 divided by 2 pi and this is R which is the distance between 1 and 2 <coughs> so that's a way we can find the force per length of a or from a current carrying wire the force created by a current carrier wire on another wire. I'm going to use that in this problem here. So in this problem, we have two wires. One of them is this blue wire going across the top. Let me make this a little bit bigger. And it has a direction of current going this way. And the current is traveling at 15 amps. We have another one, which is actually a ring of wires going in this direction, with c or the currents going in this direction. <coughs> and <coughs> this one has 30 amps going around in that loop. <coughs> we get the lengths of them there. We can look individually, just kind of conceptually, at these. If we look at the magnetic field that would be generated by that top wire, again, gripping it with your thumb in the direction of the current, you can see the magnetic field is going to curl under it. So can I go under that way? Coming out this way, shooting down through it kind of going in around in that direction and when it reaches out and gets big enough to actually get this full distance here of 7.5 centimeters it's going to have a force and an effect on the current carrying wire going the other direction um, since the two wires are traveling opposite directions of each other we can say that the force is actually going to be a, an attractive force um, it would also have a force on this wire over here. Now both of these two wires, I'm going to say, I call this one uh, segment one and segment two. So segment one has, uh, we can draw that magnetic field around it as well. It will be crossed, gripping it this way. It's going to go down under that way loop around and come out kind of like that <coughs> mm -hmm. yeah and similarly with the bottom one which is in the same direction as that top one it's going to go down like this like this But since the segment two is farther away from that f top wire, the force on that bottom wire is going to be less than the force on the top wire. So since these two are going in the same direction, that's going to be kind of a force pulling away from it. And these two are going in different directions. So that's going to be a force pulling inwards towards it. We can calculate that force per length on there using that equation we just talked about. The force per length is equal to mu naught to I1 I2 divided by 2 pi R 
In this case, we have two forces though. We have the force of F1 and the force of F2. So we have to find that net force on both of them. The net force we could define, since one of them is going to be positive and one is negative, as F1 minus F2. So plugging in those values for force 1 and force 2 on there, we can see that the net force is going to be equal to mu naught I1, I2, divided by 2 pi R1 minus mu naught I1, I2, divided by 2 pi R2. Let's use the same R for everything. Let's change this one to a little r. You can see all the common factors in there are the same except for the radius, that R value. So rewriting these in a more factored form, that's mu naught I1, I2 over 2 pi times the 1 over R1 minus 1 over R2. those things. So now defining the variables and the values we have, we say the f F is the force on the long wire, L is the length of the wire segment. And in this case, this one up here is just really long, but the only time that those two wires run in parallel is for this distance here, 30 centimeters. So I can say L is equal to 30.0 centimeters which is going to be equal to 0 0.300 oh, meters. And we can say that the magnet er sorry, the magnetic permittivity of free space, that mu naught value, that's going to be equal to 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7. Units for that is this is 7. Tesla meters per amp. The values of current, I1. In this case, this is I1 up here, which is equal to 15.0 amps. I2 is that loop on the bottom. It's equal to 30.0 amps. The distance between those wires is going to be R. So there's two different distances now. We have the distance here, kind of just between here. So the distance R1 is going to equal 7.50 centimeters, which is equal to 0 0.0750 meters. R2 is going to be that same distance plus the 10 centimeters there. So it's really 17.5 centimeters which is equal to 0 0.1750 zero meters. So now we should have all the values we need to plug into our equation to solve it. Putting in those values, we can see that mm, this is the force per length for everything. Forgot to add that little L at the bottom there. So the force per length for everything is to equal 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7 Tesla meters per amps. That's my mu naught times 15 amps times 30 amps. The I1, I2 all divided by 2 pi. And I need to multiply that by 1 divided by R1, which is going to be 0 0.0750 meters minus 1 over 0 0.175 meters. And are we trying to find the force per length or the force? the magnitude of the total force, which means we need to multiply 
<coughs> by that length. So mo multiplying by that length on both sides. Length being, he said 30 centimeters or 0 0.3 meters. And that should give us the net force on everything. <coughs> Let's plug into our calculator. Four pi times 10 to the negative seven units of Tesla meters per amp. Multiply that by 15 amps. Multiply that by 30 amps. Divide the whole thing by 2 pi. And then we're going to multiply by 1 divided by 0 0.075 minus 1 divided by 0 0.175. And then we need to multiply by 0 0.3 meters. Yeah. Then I'm just going to put my units in the bottom here. Because those were distances in meters. Everything else looks like it's there. Let's see. There we go. And we get 2.057. And it's times, I have an extra A in there. Forgot to put a little underscore there. <laughs> Something's not right. Oh, forgot my A. Forgot all this at the front still. <laughs> Calculator, that's better. Two point, it was the same answer, just it was slightly off. So 2.057 times 10 to the negative 4 newtons is what I should be getting there. So that's 0 0.0002057 newtons, or 2.057 newtons. Oh, I got the times 10 to the negative 4 newtons. So that's the magnitude of force or the net force on this wire based off of the magnetic field from that top wire up on top. So that's all I have for you today. I'm going to again paste in our attendance sheet. Make sure to fill that out there. And also stop in and talk to me in drop-in hours. I have drop-in hours from 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock today. So just right after this, basically. You can also make an appointment. There should be a link above me if you're watching in Tenji. Make an appointment with one of our great physics tutors, and we'll be happy to talk you through and talk about any homework problems, help you review for midterms, and stuff like that. Have a great day, and enjoy.